Um, and thank all of you for coming today. Uh, this is a wonderful series and uh, uh, Drake University and myself personally have had a long and very fruitful um, association with the Iowa International Center and Judy and her staff do such a wonderful job, real asset to the community. So just thank you for all that you do. Um, so uh, I was fortunate um, in May and June, uh, end of May, early June, to travel to China with a, a, a Drake travel seminar. My co-leader, Kirk Martin, is here in the audience today. And we had a, a group of students. We visited Shanghai, Guilin, and Hong Kong. For me, it was, a, it was a wonderful opportunity to go back to Hong Kong because I spent the 2010-2011 academic year uh, at the University of Hong Kong as a Fulbright scholar. So I made Made many friends there, and uh, developed a um, you know a, 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 a sense of uh, connection to the city, and I had a chance to visit people as well as uh, show the students a little bit about what Hong Kong is is like. So that was a great uh, a, a great privilege. Um, while there, we I had a chance to to talk with we had a chance to talk with a number of people who have been involved in um, some of the political. Uh, debates going on in Hong Kong. As you know, Hong Kong is a, uh, uh, let's see, I'm to, this is a uh, PC, so Hong Kong is a, is a wealthy, it's a cosmopolitan city, um, a very successful place. It's uh, it enjoys uh, relative political freedom, civic liberties that uh, exceed those elsewhere in China and, and many places in the world. Um, and yet, last fall, Hong Kong was convulsed with political unrest. Um, young people, uh, as well as uh, some older people, took to the streets in political protests that lasted for over two months. So the, the, the big question I want to ask today is, why did these hundreds of thousands of people take to the streets? What, what did they want? What were their demands? Under what was that at the time termed the Umbrella Revolution? So we'll explore this a little bit today. The, uh, the short answer is that Hong Kong has been uh, divided over and, and, and in the midst of a, uh, a fairly profound debate over how the next chief executive will be chosen. Uh, the term chief executive is used for what's equivalent of a kind of a mayor or a governor. Um, and um, the, that election is scheduled for 2017. And so the terms of that, that uh, electoral process have been subject of much uh, debate and disagreement. But really, what brought people out into the streets, what ignited the passion that you saw in the Umbrella Revolution, had to do with some deeper issues. Deeper issues that dealt with Hong Kong's own political identity, uh, with the terms of its relationship with Beijing and mainland China, and also with changes going on in China's, in Hong Kong's socioeconomic system, particularly the rise of inequality, um, greater inequality there. So I first want to talk about sort of what the debate was about on the surface, the electoral system in Hong Kong, and then I'd like to talk a little bit about some of these um, deeper issues that I think animate a lot of the a lot of the passion. So let's first talk about the question of democracy in, in Hong Kong and about um, Hong Kong's political system and status. Um, this is Hong Kong. The island itself was ceded to Great Britain by China by the, uh, under the Qing Dynasty in 1842. It was one of the unequal treaties that was forced upon China uh, as a result of, of one of the opium wars that was fought between Great Britain and China. 
Um, China today considers that those treaties were illegitimate because they were the result of, of coercion. Uh, but in any case, Hong Kong uh, proper was uh, ruled by Great Britain for about 150 years. You can still see, you know, 15 years after the, the transfer, some odd, um, the British influence is still quite evident in, in Hong Kong. And I think that has a lot to do with the, the identity issues that Hong Kong is struggling with now. Hong Kong went, uh, followed a tr different trajectory politically than the rest of China. In 1860, um, China was forced again to concede territory. Uh, the British demanded control over Kowloon, which is on, on the, it's attached to the mainland. It's an area um, just north of Hong Kong. And uh, then in, in, in 1898, uh, the British signed an agreement with China that provided them with a 99-year lease on what were called the New Territories. So the vast majority of the actual land area of today's Hong Kong is, is actually in the New Territories, the areas north of Kowloon. <coughs> because the New Territories, unlike Hong Kong and Kowloon, were a lease arrangement with a limited time duration, it meant that, that, that the British knew that come 1997, that they that lease would run up and new territories would would be returned to China. It was determined that without the new territories, that Hong Kong and Kowloon alone were uh, not viable under British control. So the British reconciled themselves to the idea that in 1997 that that they would have to cede all of Hong Kong as indeed the Chinese Beijing had. Uh, had uh, demanded. So negotiations began in the, in the early 1980s. In 1984, it led to the Sino-British Declaration, uh, which laid out a roadmap toward the transfer of Hong Kong sovereignty back to China, which occurred in, in 1997. Along the way, in 1991, the National People's Congress in China, the main legislative body, uh, passed what was called the Basic Law, which followed the contours set out in the Sino-British Declaration of 1984. Um, basically, the, what the, the British and the, the Chinese negotiated, the Hong Kong people didn't really have much, much involvement, but was a formula called One Country, Two Systems. So the idea is that Hong Kong would be returned to Chinese sovereignty, but at the same time, Beijing pledged to respect Hong Kong's uh, existing political and cultural and economic system. So Hong Kong is part of China, but it's very odd. You have to actually uh, move from one to the other. You have to actually um, you know, go through, through immigration and customs. Hong Kong has its own passport, its own currency, its own custom system. Um, it has its own legal code uh, that is passed down from the British years, the colonial period. It has its own independent judiciary, right? In fact, the Hong Kong was prior to the handover a member of many international organizations and continues to have an independent representation in those organizations as if it were an independent state. Um, Hong Kong, uh, culturally, it, it, uh, the, the native language there is Cantonese, uh, different from the mainland, which is Mandarin. So Hong Kong is, is, uh, continues to be quite distinct in many ways and has, uh, and, and we'll talk about the degree to which Beijing has kept its pledge to sort of let Hong Kong govern itself. Um, uh, there's, there's some concern that, 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 that those promises uh, are, have grown somewhat uh, thin in recent years. 
I should add that Hong Kong, that the basic law also pledged to protect the civil liberties, freedom of the press, religion, etc. that, you know, sort of America's Bill of Rights type liberties. We prom promised to respect those after the handover and also promised to, to move toward uh, electoral democracy with universal suffrage, suffrage um, without giving a specific deadline or, or exactly uh, explaining what that meant. But that's included, in, um, we'll see, in Article 45 of the Basic Law. So the issue of, of democracy and what form it will take, how, how quickly it will, it will be established, uh, what universal suffrage means, all of these have really occupied Hong Kong politics and its relationship with Beijing since 1997. So the protests that we saw last fall didn't come out of nowhere. They, the, these debates have been going on for a long time. There have been prior periods of, of, of sort of mass protests, as I'll mention a little bit later. Uh, so this wasn't the first time people have taken to the streets in large numbers. Um, and, and so there's a, been an ongoing back and forth over how the political system should work and it will continue to be debated, I'm sure, uh, uh, in the future. Now what is Hong Kong, um, what, is it, what does the actual political system look like? Let me, uh, I'll come back to that one. <laughs> That's a, um, so, Hong Kong has approximately, roughly 18 political parties. Um, it fluctuates because political parties come and go. They're often built around p the personalities of particular politicians. Um, they're divided into two main groupings. The pan-democrats, as they're called, um, and the pro-Beijing parties. Um, and these, um, these groups differ in terms of their attitudes towards relationship with Beijing. The pan-democrats have pushed all along for as much autonomy and as much democracy as, as possible. The Beijing parties have sided with Chinese government at times when it has resisted moving as quickly. The, uh, the pan-democrats, uh, from the perspective of Beijing, they're not, they're not trusted. They're seen as, uh, as not loyal to, to Beijing or to China, as unpatriotic. In fact, it wasn't until 2013 that Beijing officials agreed to even meet with pan-democratic politicians. And in, and in that meeting, one of the pan-democrats asked, um, will Beijing ever allow someone from a pan-democratic party to serve as chief executive in Hong Kong? The answer was that um, the fact that you are still alive is a measure of our tolerance. So there's no, there's no love lost there uh, between, between these groups. There's a, 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 a gulf of trust. There is the legisl uh, something called the uh, legislature is called LegCo. It has 70 members. Half of them are chosen through direct election through uh, geographic districts. So that you, you know a representative represents a particular neighborhood or an area in the city. The other half, it's a little odd from our perspective. It, they're called functional constituencies. So that those seats are held by people who represent different groupings in Hong Kong society. So they may be um, bankers or lawyers or labor unions or um, you know, um, commercial, you know, retail establishments. There's, there's a long list of, of, of groups and it's not only individuals within those groups who are, who get some kind of voting right toward those represent, representatives, it's also corporate entities, uh, banks, businesses, um, uh, professional associations, um, you know, they actually have voting rights. 
the equivalent of you know an individual. So these representatives are chosen through functional constituencies. If you add up all of the people who have some right to, to vote uh, on uh, functional representatives in Hong Kong, it adds up to about 230,000 people out of a population of 7.2 million. So it's, you know, it's supposed to be widely representative, but people say, uh, you know, it's not representing a lot of people who don't get to vote toward those functional constituencies. So that's a, that the, the makeup and, and the electoral rules for LegCo are also, have been a subject of debate. LegCo is, is relatively weak uh, as legislatures go. Uh, the chief executive is a more powerful position, uh, as somewhat equivalent to a, a governor. The current chief executive is C.Y. Leung. Um, he is widely unpopular uh, uh, within Hong Kong, at least, especially among the people that, that, that we met, um, for a variety of reasons, but the degree of his unpopularity was underscored for me at the June 4th candlelight vigil, I'll mention a, a moment, when I, I went to the men's room and used the urinal, and I looked down and here's what I saw. It was a tiny little cardboard cutout of C.Y. Leung's head in the urinal itself. And when you flushed, the, his, his head jumped up and sort of did a little dance. It was, it was really quite interesting. So, um, yeah. So he's, he's very unpopular and um, one of the reasons is that there were two candidates in the last, I won't call it an election, it was a selection, and um, he attacked the other candidate for having some, having done some illegal additions to his home. And, uh, you know, that embarrassed and, and, and hurt the other candidate, but later was found out that C.Y. Leung had done the exact same thing except even on a bigger scale. Um, so, so the chief exec, he was not chosen by direct popular vote. Um, he was chosen through rules I'll mention in a moment. So how is the, how did the basic, what did the basic law say about the selection of the chief executive? Well, you see it, it says that, it has these two, two uh, provisions, it says, the chief executive shall be selected by election or through consultations held locally and be appointed by the central people's government. The method for selecting the chief executive shall be specified in light of the actual situation in, in Hong Kong and in accordance with the principle of gradual and orderly progress. The ultimate aim is the selection of the chief executive by universal suffrage upon nomination by a broadly representative nominating committee in accordance with democratic procedures. A bit convoluted. Uh, in practice, what that, that has meant up till now is that there is an elect, election co uh, committee composed of 1,200 people who are selected um, uh, themselves are chosen by these functional constituencies. Again, about 230,000 people have some are able to vote through one means or another for these. 1,200 members of the election commission or committee. Um, and they represent this long list of functional constituencies. Members of, uh, well, Beijing, and then what they do is that the, up until now, the elect election committee would nominate candidates. There would be a period of sort of, in which they would publicly debate uh, or, or present their platforms and make themselves familiar to the city as a whole, but in particular to this committee which will make the final choice. So the, and then the committee would, would choose among them. So the committee both nominated the candidates and then made the final choice. The, the, the successful nominee would actually have to be approved finally by Beijing. So uh, Beijing held the ultimate right to veto a, nom uh, a nominee, even if 
that nominee had gotten a majority of votes in the election committee. So, in general, people were unhappy with this arrangement. It gave, uh, of course, a lot of sway to these, this election committee. And the pan-democrats in particular felt that that committee was stacked with pro-Beijing representatives. Uh, often uh, the, the functional cons constituencies uh, lean heavily in favor of, of business interests um, who want to, to, to stay on the right side of Beijing because it, it affects their business interests. Now, you saw in the, the, this uh, Article 45, it does say that the ultimate aim is the selection of the chief executive by universal suffrage. Um, the National People's Congress proposed uh, a, a change in the procedures for 2017 election. The change would be that um, there would be an, uh, uh, multiple candidates running for chief executive and they would be voted on directly by the population through universal suffrage. So that all sounds quite democratic. The sticking point was in who, who would be able to run for office. And the, the latest proposal from the National People's Congress is that the election committee would still have the sole right to nominate candidates so that people would have an ability to, 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 uh, um, to vote on who would win the election, but the, the question of who got to run for chief executive office would be determined by the election committee, which again was not seen as representatives, and in particular it was seen as unlikely to ever nominate anyone from the pan-democratic camp. That was, that's what it kind of comes down to. Would it be, ever be possible for someone from a pan-democratic political party to actually run for chief executive and then be elected? And that was uh, seen as very unlikely under this, this arrangement. So <clears throat> the pan-democrats as well as civil society groups suggested alternative proposals such as civic nomination where you might set a threshold let's say you have to have collect signatures of 70,000 you know uh, registered voters uh, if you got more than that then you would be nominated to run for, for uh, chief executive um, or nomination by political parties, sort of like the United States does it, right? That was another idea. Um, there were hybrids that nominees, candidates could be nominated either through one of the two mention, means I just mentioned or by the election commission, committee so that either route would, would be a possibility. Um, the other question, if you're going to have a, an open nomination process, you're probably going to get more than two or three candidates. So then the question is, you know, how do you finally, you know, choose the, the winner? Um, a group of uh, um, scholars at the University of Hong Kong, uh, legal scholars, suggested a two-round election where the, if no one got 50% or more in the first round, then you would have a runoff election among the top two. <clears throat> so there were alternatives put forward and the, the, those who, who objected to the NPC proposal demanded negotiations with Beijing and with the Hong Kong government over revisions to the NPC proposal, right? Or alternatives to the NPC proposal. And those negotiations were rejected. It was basically, here's our proposal, uh, take it or leave it. Now the NPC proposal had to uh, get a, it had to survive a vote in the LegCo, which I'll come to in a moment. Um, so there was some Hong Kong, uh, Hong Kong had a kind of veto power over the proposal, but um, Beijing was unwilling to negotiate to look into alternatives. So as a result of this kind of stalemate, a group called Occupy Central with Occupy Central with Love and something else. Love was in there, I know. 
um, said we're going to hold we're going to hold demonstrations in, in the financial center downtown. We're going to shut down the financial district for anywhere from a few days to you know a couple weeks as a protest and to put pressure on the authorities to negotiate. Um, this uh, this effort actually was kind of preempted because young people, students with the Hong Kong Federation of Students, as well as a group called Scholarism, um, young people uh, decided to move before Occupy Central did. So they actually sent their own members into the streets and Occupy not just Central, but several locations in the city. And the Occupy Central is older, more established pan-democratic politicians and, 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 and civic leaders. They were kind of taken by surprise and, and had to catch up. So eventually the two sets of groups merged their efforts, but it was an interesting signal that the young people thought that even the, the older generation was being too timid and, and, and they wanted a, a, a more even more confrontational and a broader scale kind of protest. And ultimately, uh, what came to be called the Umbrella Revolution uh, stayed in the streets more than two months. So, uh, and, and the students were um, sort of in the lead on this. This is Joshua Wong. He was a, uh, he is, I, I guess he still is, the uh, leader of Scholarism which was a, um, a group of high school students actually who came out a few years before it to were organized to protest against changes in the educational curriculum. Um, he's very young, he, I'm not sure exactly what age he is now. I think at the time of the protest he may have only been 19 or something like that. From my perspective that's impossibly ludicrously young. So. Um, this is what people wanted. Uh, said they wanted freedom, democracy, universal suffrage. It was dubbed the Umbrella Revolution because, you know, they're out in the streets all day in the hot sun, so part of it's just having an umbrella as a way to keep cool. But mostly it was the umbrellas were useful when the police shot pepper spray at the demonstrators. So um, everyone carried umbrellas and uh, you can see the, the police and the, the demonstrators facing off here with their, they have their umbrellas at the ready. More umbrellas. <clears throat> this was actually a little, <laughs> this is kind of funny because uh, this is President Xi Jinping. China's president. And um, I've forgotten where he, he was, maybe someone else will remember. He was out in a public setting and it started to rain or drizzle and he, he, he pulled out an umbrella or someone handed him an umbrella and he held it himself. Actually in China this was seen as People like this because normally Chinese leaders, somebody else would hold the umbrella for you, right? An underling. But here, he's a common man, a man of the people. He's holding his own umbrella, so that was very popular. Um, but what, since there were photos of him doing so, the the the, the color of associated with the umbrella revolution was yellow. So someone photoshopped. This was actually, I think, originally probably a black umbrella. They photoshopped to make it yellow, so it looked like Xi Jinping was in solidarity with the demonstrators. The the Hong Kong Federation of Students, for instance, representing the eight major universities, has now split. And so four, four of the university's student associations have broken off and they're now just doing their own thing. So there's been a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of um, disappointment with where things ended up. Um, 
Where do things stand now? Well, um, on June 17th, just a couple weeks ago, the LegCo finally voted on the NPC proposal for the next election. And it, for the pan-Democrats, it was an agonizing vote. Because on the one hand, they didn't want to endorse a procedure that they saw as falling short of their demands for full democracy. And that would still leave in the hands of the election committee the nomination process, which I said was almost certainly bound to exclude the pan-Democrats themselves. Um, so they didn't want to kind of give legitimacy to, to that proposal. They wanted what they saw as a, a, a full, full universal suffrage. On the other hand, in, by blocking that proposal, what would the election rules be in 2017? Well, if the NPC proposal were rejected, you just go back to the existing rules in which the exec election committee not only nominates but also selects. And that's exactly what happened. The pan-democrats had enough votes. It had to pass, I think, by two-thirds majority. They had enough votes to veto passage. And so now we're just thrown back on the old rules, which everyone agrees are worse than the rules that were proposed. So really the pan-democrats um, don't have a strategy at this point. And, and um, it's unclear what's going to happen. Now, um, I see my time is passing so quickly, I'm going to speed up a little bit. Besides this debate over electoral rules, there are three underlying um, divisions that are pushing political change in Hong Kong. Um, one is the growth of social economic inequality. Is if me measured by what's the so-called Gini index, which is a measure of economic inequality, Hong Kong has one of the highest levels of inequality of any significant state or entity uh, economic society in the world. Ha China has a very high level of economic inequality. Hong Kong is even higher than China, mainland China. So that the gulf between rich and poor is, is truly staggering. On the one hand, you have extraordinarily wealthy bankers and pro property developers in Hong Kong. On the other hand, you have this. There are 100,000 people living in cage homes. These are literally cages that people rent. Uh, this is a man who, who lives in one of these cages, and it's just big enough to lie down in, basically. So, uh, in, in a, such a wealthy society, uh, this is rather shocking. Hong Kong, partly as a British legacy, they do not have much of a social safety net, so people fall through. There's also a critical shortage of affordable housing, not just for the poor, but for, for most people. Um, so for instance, you know, property prices have skyrocketed so much that young people are forced to live with their families well into their 30s, uh, which makes you know, marriage difficult and, and um, it's frustrating both for the children and their parents, I'm sure, at times. Um, so not enough, not enough affordable housing. <clears throat> The second major um, concern among people is with some of the negative uh, influences that the mainland has on, on, uh, on Hong Kong. <laughs> this is one. Manufacturing has completely left Hong Kong now, moved across the border and, and kind of ballooned. Shenzhen is a major fa manufacturing area. And when the wind is blowing from north to south, then you get pollution like that uh, on the uh, left-hand side here. Um, so air pollution is, is a big complaint. When it's blowing from south to north, then you get a day like you see here on the right. Um, so Hong Kong really has done a lot to try to improve its air quality, but it's not in control of that. It's what's going on across the border. 
40 million Chinese visit a, a city with 7 million and, you know, residents, 40 million visit each year. That's up, you know, enormously. On the one hand, they're spending money, it supports the local economy. On the other hand, there are sort of two kinds of, two, two levels at which this, this tourism takes place. There's kind of the low-end tourism, and these are, are, are Chinese, middle-class Chinese or, uh, who are not wealthy at all, who are save up money to go on these kind of low-cost tourist junkets and stay in pretty low-end hotels and you know restaurants, and et cetera. The problem here is that Hong Kong people, sometimes in ugly ways, tend to look down on these tourists and look down on their manners and, and their, their customs. Uh, you know, things like eating noodles on the uh, subway train or, or letting a, a, a baby pee in the, you know, uh, on the sidewalk. Things like that uh, get videotaped and put up on YouTube or something else and then there's this big outcry about the bad manners of, of mainlanders. Um, the other end are the high-end tourists who come to Hong Kong to shop for luxury goods and so luxury stores are everywhere in Hong Kong and they're pushing out the mom and pop stores for local people and so um, you know that's frustrating. Um, I don't know if this is still, when I was there, a statistic I heard was that 45% of births in Hong Kong were to mainland mothers who come there to, so their babies have, their children have Hong Kong residency rights. Um, that's widely resented. There was a, a, a scandal with tainted, tainted in, infant formula in, in mainland China. That led to uh, mainlanders coming to Hong Kong to buy up infant formula, resulting in shortages locally. There's uh, concerns about the spread of Mandarin and the decline of Cantonese and the culture it represents. The media have become much less independent. Um, they're usually owned by some kind of business conglomerate whose interests can be, who has interests in the mainland and those interests can be negatively affected were they to allow the reporters to be too candid in reporting on problems with, in, um, with respect to Beijing or Hong Kong's own government. 2003, the local government responding to pressure from Beijing tried to pass an anti-subversion law that was seen as, as uh, harming the civil liberties that Hong Kong people cherish. That was resisted through massive uh, protests, 500,000 people in the streets. It was ultimately pulled back, so the protests were successful. 2011, similarly, there was an effort to, to insert a patriotic education curriculum into the schools. This was resisted because it was thought that the curriculum would, uh, would, would not be so much about Chinese patriotism as about supporting the Communist Party's version of history. Uh, that led to protests. Scholarism, the, 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 the group that Joseph Wong heads, they spearheaded this, high school students, and it was also defeated. I think those two victories were one reason why some people in Hong Kong thought that their, you know, the umbrella revolution could succeed because Beijing had already backed down twice on major initiatives. This time, though, no luck. The third area, um, quickly, is the, the emergence of a distinct Hong Kong identity. The older generation, even among the pan-democrats, they don't really question their Chinese identity. Um, but they want democracy in Hong Kong and China. So they don't have a problem with being part of China, but they want, um, they want to change the political systems. Many of the older generation, they or their, their um, ancestors, fled mainland China over the past century during times of unrest or political per persecution. So they, they felt strong connection and roots in China. Um, the younger generation born in Hong Kong, they are rebelling against this Chinese identity, asserting a, a separate Hong Kong identity. Um, 
they want to be separate, autonomous, and, and free of Chinese rule and influence. Uh, some favor even independence for Hong Kong. <clears throat> In uh, a good focal point for these differences is the June 4th candlelight vigil held every year since 1989 to commemorate the martyrs of the uh, Tiananmen Square crackdown in, in that year against the pro-democracy movement. Um, this candlelight vigil uh, you know, often draws more than 100,000 people. You can see the massive numbers there, all with their, all with their candles. Um, people sit down in Victoria Park, they light their candles, and there are speeches and other kinds of activities. Now, uh, this is a, a actually, the, the Drake students are, are somewhere in this, this photo. We went to it, 2015. This is a young woman who was collecting photographs. She wanted 100 different photos of people with her carrying her sign, so I told her I'd let her photograph me if I could photograph her. Now, um, the older generation sees the visual as, as part of a call for a rebirth of democracy movement in China itself. They want to democratize China. The younger generation has a different view. Their attitudes are that the visual re reinforces the idea that China and Hong Kong are the same. And that achieving democracy, their view is that achieving, uh, that June 4th crackdown took place in another country a long time ago has nothing to do with Hong Kong. The focus should be on Hong Kong uh, defending its autonomy and, and, and achieving its democracy. So um, there's, they're not optimistic that Hong Kong can influence political change in China, but they are concerned that China is influencing politics in Hong Kong. So this year, several uh, um, so-called localist groups organized alternative uh, uh, assemblies to compete with the June 4th vigil. Now they're kind of right and left on, uh, among the so-called localists. The right are kind of, uh, my characterization is kind of chauvinistic. Uh, they refer to mainlanders who come into Hong Kong as locusts. Um, they are, um, they use language that, that we hear in other, you know, kind of highly nationalized uh, uh, rhetoric. Uh, on the other hand, there's also a left wing which says, what is Hong Kong identity? What is distinctive about Hong Kong? What's distinctive about Hong Kong is its cosmopolitan character, its, its role as a bridge between East and West, and it's precisely that sense of global citizenship that, act, that makes Hong Kongers distinctive from any other people, including Chinese. Now, of course, there's little chance in practice of Hong Kong independence. It relies upon China for all of its water supply, 70% of its food and energy. The economy is heavily integrated with China, has no military, and China's sovereignty is over Hong Kong's internationally recognized. Um, one reason China granted autonomy to Hong Kong was to avoid scaring away investors. The other reason was to hold out the promise to Taiwan that they would get a similar or better deal and uh, uh, attract Taiwan to reunify. But now Hong Kong is less essential economically to China. Its, its GDP used to equal 16% of China's, now it's only 2 or 3%. Uh, Shanghai and Shenzhen are, are alternative financial centers. And Hong Kong's uh, autonomy is seen um, not as a positive example for Taiwan, but as a source of possible contagion effects spurring separatist sentiment in Ta Tibet, Xinjiang, or Taiwan. So my conclusion is that in the coming period, there's little prospect of fruitful negotiations between the pro-democracy camp and Beijing. Uh, among the pro-democrats, I think the focus really needs to be on dialogue within the pro-democracy camp to overcome differences in goals and tactics. And then once they've gotten their act together, uh, there needs to be a period of engagement with civil society to try to build a foundation uh, to, uh, upon which to have some, some strength and uh, some point of future negotiations.